Welcome to the Tambellini Group's New Normal in Higher Ed. I'm Rachel Clemens, and joining me here today is Melissa Wu, Dr. Melissa Wu, who is Executive Vice President for Administration and Chief Information Officer at Michigan State University, and also, if that wasn't enough, is also the President of the Michigan State University Foundation. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you so much, Ray. I really appreciate being asked to be on your show. Thanks. Thanks for being here. I think we're going to have a great conversation today. I'm really looking forward to it. So, Melissa, you have this title that is like a mile long, and it includes more than just the CIO. And it sounds like maybe it's a little bit um, about what we've referred to as like a CIO plus role. So can you tell us a little bit more about the role you have and how you ended up being in this position? Well, what's so funny is I do have three jobs. And it is an example of how things that you say early in your career come back to bite you. I used to say the longer your title is, the less important you are. So <laughs> maybe I'll just leave everyone with that idea floating. Um, so the way it came up about was having a university president that really thinks very broadly and I think somewhat progressively, someone who really understood that a CIO does see every part of the university, every part of the business, yep. and was willing to take a chance, I think, on me. I mean, the, the role is over what I would call enterprise-wide administrative services that have primarily internal facing customers. Now, try saying that five times fast. <laughs> so, so, I mean, so that includes <laughs> things such as uh, human resources, infrastructure planning and facilities, you know, that sort of thing. And we're actually in the process of reconstituting the position and adding more back into it that used to be part of this portfolio. So it really will become the portfolio of these enterprise-wide enterprise services that are primarily internal facing. And so I, I think what it is is a real recognition from a university president that a CIO can do things beyond just being the head of IT, that the role itself gives you such a broad viewpoint and so much insight into every part of the business that it, it's possible to make that next step into overseeing other parts of the business. So I think that idea that that um, CIOs can demonstrate themselves as sort of true business or or in this case university le university leaders, not just technical leaders, is is kind of what's behind that idea of a CIO plus role, right? Do you think? I mean, this is kind of a nascent idea still. I mean, you're doing it. I know some other uh, leaders who are doing it, but but we don't really see that a lot. But do you think it's going to start becoming more commonplace in the future? Um, and especially, you know since the pandemic, you know, what role do you think that that might have in, in evolving the nature of this role as well? I think that the pandemic helped organizations to realize just how critical the role of IT is, but maybe more importantly, how IT actually really does understand how to support the business. I mean, so many of us, you know, jumped ahead and brought in services that were ones that could be easily transferred to online or were already online and support online students, educators, and staff. I mean, a lot of us thought ahead and did that. But so I think as more and more CEOs and presidents and chancellors see that, hey, you know, my head of IT really truly understands enrollment, understands education, understands research for those of us at research universities and understands the outreach mission of many of the public universities, which I at right now, is they'll see this capability of stretching beyond overseeing IT. So I think it's a, I think it's a thing, as, as people say. <laughs> and I mean, you know, what I'm really hoping is to see more of the CEOs, presidents, and chancellors think broadly the way that our university president does, and actually can see that as the future for people who are currently in IT roles. What do you, so I, I'm thinking you've got the administration role. Um, earlier on this show, I interviewed Dr. Malcolm, who is a combined CIO and I think enrollment and marketing are her yes, titles. She has she a very broad role as well. Um, uh, and actually, I think you know her. I think she mentioned you. But, um, you know, do you see sort of natural affinities in, in the role at all? Or what should presidents or chancellors be looking for as they're looking at their CIO for their ability to do this type of thing? And Jackie is amazing, by the way. So I want to make sure I give a shout out to Jackie because she's fantastic. I, you know, she is one of those examples of natural affinities based on her skill set. So IT and enrollment, I mean, enrollment management is so dependent on data and understanding technology and how to interact with 
prospective students. Yep. That natural affinity. And I could also argue that, you know, a while back, we all talked about the, you know, chief digital officers. We also talked about chief um, media officers also being aligned with CIOs. And so uh, Jackie's role as the head of communications also fits. However, in a case such as mine, where, you know, administrative services are ones that I look at as number one, you have to keep the trains running on time, which is something that CIOs <laughs> always say you have to do or else you don't get a role at the strategic table. Um, all the services that I oversee and will be overseeing are of that nature, but at the same time, they're also strategic parts of the university, but maybe not yet recognized by everyone yet. So for example, HR is strategic. It's not a strategic partner. It is a strategic part of the university, just as IT is, just right. as infrastructure and planning and facilities is as well. And so there are these natural affinities in different areas. I think it really depends on the place you're at and the individuals involved. Yeah, so thinking about that, others of us have had, I had innovation, which wasn't just technology innovation, right, at, in the last role. And then I can think of another colleague who had marketing. So I do, it is some some combination of affinities between the roles and maybe the experience and skill set of the person in the role as well. So I'm really struck by the idea that as educational leaders, we often are talking about and hearing about the, the idea of the future of work, right, and, and how different things will be. And when we have those conversations, it seems like those are mostly about our students. Oh, we have to prepare students for this future of work. And I don't know to what degree we've really looked internally and thought about the future of work as it relates to the university, as it relates to faculty and staff roles. Um, that seems to kind of hum along sort of as it's always hummed along. So with the pandemic, it, we've seen some obvious changes to this, this idea of, of the nature of work, certainly in the idea that we could re work remotely, which I know a lot of universities have, um, up until this last year, have said wasn't possible. And then with the CIO role, we're also, the CIO plus role, we're also seeing maybe the changing nature of, of the work as well. What do you think about for other employees? Do you, um, do you see that we're going to see changes to what university staff do and how and where they do it um, changing in this post-pandemic world? And if so, in, in what ways do you think that will happen? Well, definitely, Ray. I think things are going to change. I think the pandemic has clearly put people in a place where they realize all the possibilities. Now, the, there's a natural tension, though, for those of us who work in on-premise or place-based universities, is that part of the reason why we never thought we could all go remote was because we are so place-based. I mean, it's part of what we are. It's part of our identity. It's what we, well, quite frankly, sell to the students. Is right. that this is our value add because we have a physical place where you can interact as opposed to being entirely online. And that I think has transferred over to the faculty and staff side is that we feel we need to be place-based. Team, prove us all, prove us <laughs> wrong, right? I mean, right. Well, most of us are, are working entirely remotely at this point. So what's really interesting about the role I'm in right now is I see just the permanent remote worker issue being one that is cross-cutting across the areas that I oversee. So our HR office is actually starting to work on policy now, although we do have some people that are working from out of state. It's only it's it's you know here and there. It's not large groups or large units of people all working either from other parts of the state, out of state or even internationally for MSU. Right. So we have HR that's going to be involved with policy, which for state university is an interesting conversation because it means potentially less income tax for the state. And in our case, Michigan actually also charges you income tax in the city in which you work. Oh, so wow. <laughs> issues, um, also could cause some interesting issues in unionized shops as well, which happens at a, at a lot of public universities. So it cuts right. across HR. It will impact planning and facilities for obvious reasons, because I mean, one of the things that with my CIO hat on, I'll put that <laughs> hat on, I see that a number of our offices are in what used to be classrooms. Well, we don't need to be there. The, if we still believe that there is a large place-based component for our students, and I still believe that there is, well, that's the job for them for planning and facilities. Sustainability also reports through Maine. So this is a great sustainability story about <laughs> having fewer people commute to work and, and that, you know, 
so it's a great narrative around our sustainability and, and IT, better quality of, course, of life too, and right? better quality of life. Yes. And <laughs> IT of course is the center of it all because IT provides the services that allow people to work remotely in a way that's productive. So it's interesting in this role about having think this one topic be cross cutting. I think some of the challenges that we'll see of course, is we're not used to managing people in this environment, even though there are, there are you know, international corporations who have been doing it for years and years and years and years. So the question is right. why, why do we think we can't manage people this way? The other thing that we're looking at in thing is, well, we no longer have the financial benefit of being a place that's extremely inexpensive to live because someone who has a job with, with New York City salaries could be living in East Lansing. So I think we lost competitiveness that way. I right. think we'll see going forward, but I think that this is this. What's great about it? So let's look at the positives. What's great about it is, to a certain extent, we can provide flex time to people—people people who have families, people who have aged parents they're trying to take care of. We could actually provide more coverage simply for that reason for our customers, and this also means again, Ed, what you said, quality of life is better. You commute here is not that bad, except in the winter, <laughs> of course. But I can imagine the place where a commute might be an hour and a half. This this would be a great benefit to be able to work remotely. So I mean, there are just there's so much benefits to working remotely that I think it's there's the value is so high that it's worth the time it's going to take to work through all the policy and practice and standards and, and work through our management issues, which I think are really not issues, honestly. I think that's all in our heads. The the talent issue strikes me as going both ways, having lived and worked in um small upper Midwestern communities, sometimes there isn't, you know, you can't find an Oracle DBA or you can't find a, you know, somebody with a particular skill set. So it could work both ways, right? You could also have access to talent you didn't have access to before because they don't so. want to move to East Lansing. <laughs> and also it might help us with our diversity as well, is that the because it does allow us to hire people that might be from different backgrounds who are either who are in under supported, you know, marginalized, minoritized backgrounds that don't live in this area and would never want to live in this area. Yeah. So I'm looking I'm looking forward to that as well. So when we talk about the changing nature of work, and especially in post-pandemic, a lot of conversation is about remote, but what about the other aspects of the work that we do? Do you think that, that actually what we do, not just where we do it, is also changing in the academy? I think it is I'm trying to be careful here because I always wonder <laughs> what's going to happen to our educators. Be you know, I I think it will provide us more flexibility in what we can offer as a campus. It, all the talk about you know on-premise campuses going online or hybrid, I think, can be a reality. But I think we have to be very careful. I think it also. I think we have to think about how we work. I mean, all we're all going through Zoom fatigue right now. Do right. and it's only because we've taken the analog or the the in place versions of ourselves at work and transferred them into a virtual world, which makes zero sense when you think about it. I mean, I do feel strongly I do need to see people face to face, even if it's through video on a regular basis, but it doesn't have to be for 10 hours a day straight. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it, we we do need to think more about using asynchronous collaboration tools or at least not spending all of our time on video because it's just this real time interaction is exhausting, number one. But I think number two, maybe not the best and most effective use of anybody's time. So I think it will affect us that way. We just have to learn how. And we're just so stuck right. in the old way of doing things that we can't seem to get past, you know, having to be in constant video conferencing meetings. Well, it, I mean, it strikes me as analog to any other technology transition that we've had, right, where we take the old thing that we've always done and we apply technology to it. And it would, it, so we're doing kind of the same thing just with technology as opposed to really rethinking the, you know, how we work, how we operate, how it, how that process functions so that you really can leverage the the, the tech. And so I think that process is still happening with this idea of remote work, right? It kind of makes you think about the next generation. Will they have fewer hangups than we do? I think, <laughs> I, I, okay, so I apologize in advance. Maybe I shouldn't be lumping the two of us together in sort of the same, you know, group. I'm a Gen Xer. How about you? Uh, yeah, I'm a Gen Xer too. Okay, <laughs> so we're roughly the same group. I'm just sort of wondering if the next generations are going to have fewer of these hangups where they feel they need to completely replicate the on-premise experience to the virtual world. 
Yeah, I, I think it's much more, I mean, the, what I've seen and, and and sort of what I've observed is just that it's much more fluid, right? And this is, I think, the technology state we need to get to as organizations overall. It's not that there's this thing and then technology is this layer on top of it, but it's much more this kind of interwoven fluid experience where, you know, sometimes it's this and sometimes it's that, but you're not really thinking about it in those binary type terms. Am I doing tech enabled or am I, you know, synchronous or asynchronous? Am I doing online or offline? It just... It's just learning, and that happens in a variety of ways. That's my, that's my soapbox. But <laughs> I agree with you. I mean, the whole term "tech enabled" is is becoming an anachronism because what isn't now? Right. <laughs> I mean, there are some things I, I freely admit, but anything we're doing in the workforce at this point, for the most part, is tech enabled. E even if it's a purely manual job, at some point, you are reporting your time, which goes through a computer. So that's tech enabled in its own way. Your schedule. I mean, you know, yeah, your light, schedule. Light bulbs are tech enabled. Uh, heating systems are tech enabled. I mean, yeah. everything. <laughs> so, uh, at some point, we're just going to get rid of that term entirely, and it's just going to be the way we work and yeah, fluid, the way that you're just saying. That, that's my hope for sure. I think the other thing that institutions are really going to have to uh, struggle with, because I agree with you in this notion of place based learning, there's still some role for that. So, if, if you're the entirety of your um, culture isn't based on everybody being physically there, then how do you maintain or, or, or build a new culture? But how do you actually build a culture that embraces the fact that some people are there and some people aren't when you're still very much preferencing this idea of place-based learning, right? And so how do you not then um, bias against the people who aren't physically on campus because of this much more flexible remote work environment, if that makes any sense, it may not, but. It does make sense. The interesting question though, is assuming this is the way we're going, where some people are on premise and, and some people are fully remote, at what point will that sh the bias shift away from people who are remote and the bias is then shifts towards people who have to be on premise? I don't know. I mean, maybe that will never happen because we clearly as a place-based university value being on premise. So maybe there will never be a bias against people that work on premise. I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, things feel more or less seamless right now, except for the Zoom fatigue issue. <laughs> but I, I mean, I only had about three months, eh, three and a half months on campus because I mean, I started the job on December 1st last year. So it's been oh, coming up on a year. Wow, and then COVID, that... COVID hit. <laughs> and so what? It was three and a half months or something like that. And I've been remote ever since. I mean, I've been back to my office exactly three times. One was to clear everything out once I realized I wasn't going back for a long time. <laughs> I think once to get a package. <laughs> and I think once because they were working on internet in my neighborhood and I had to be on video conferences. Guess what? That's it. Wow. Yeah, that's uh and tomorrow, by the way, is December 1st. So so happy, happy early anniversary to <laughs> oh, you. Thank you. <laughs> So let's let's bring this all back together again. So if if the if where we're working is changing, if maybe what we're working on is changing, if the fluidity of the work environment, you know, is something we want to think about or change, you know, what should IT leaders and and institutional leaders, quite frankly, be thinking about and doing to prepare themselves for the changing nature of work in in um, higher education? I think what I'm about to say applies no matter what. It isn't just because we're changing because of being remote. I think one of the things that we've lost sight of is the student, faculty, and staff experience is in changing the way we work, whether it's on-premise or online or some mix of the two, is we really need to focus on how people are experiencing the yeah. services that we provide, whether they be technology-enabled, haha, <laughs> tech-enabled, <laughs> whether they be tech-enabled services or entirely in-person services, that we really need to look at how people are experiencing us. And I think we lose sight of that because we get into all of our little silos and we often optimize for how best to do our jobs as opposed to how best to provide a great experience for the people that are using our services. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that's the way we should look at it. And it goes back to the idea of being fluid, like you were saying before, is there needs to be a fluidity between online, on-premise, hybrid. I mean, that experience should be seamless, and it's not. I'm the first to admit right. that it's not. I mean, these are things we should be thinking about. I mean, how do our students experience us, whether they are entirely remote, entirely on-premise, or a combination of both? 
Yeah. And I, I actually, I, I love that idea. I totally agree with you. And the thing I will say, I think um, to the degree that we do focus on experience, it is almost always um, student experience. And I think we're going to see in this in this new world some sort of um, I don't know if resurgence, but an actual surgence <laughs> of uh, I'm not sure that's a word, but but a, a rise of a focus on employee experience because I don't think we've really thought about that at all uh, up until now. So no, and why not? Because we all complain about retention. <laughs> well, well, really, I mean the. If you're having problems with employee retention, it probably has to do with the fact that you're not giving your employees a great experience. Good point. All right, so the future is all about uh, the, the experience, student experience, faculty experience, and, and staff uh, experience. Yes. Thank you, Melissa. It's been great to talk to you today. I really appreciate your time, and I look forward to, uh, to seeing, seeing you in person again sometime soon. That would be great, and thank you so much for having me on your, your show, Ray.